Yeah, no, it's good. Good. Yeah. What you got? No. Okay. Not at the moment, anyway. Not at the moment. Is it okay if we made a make a video? Yeah, no, that's fine. Teaching. You know, there may be some some other people wanting to learn this approach, learn about hypnosis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's helpful to to have some experience that they can observe and maybe learn from. Yep, oh, that's fine. Thank you. Um, can you tell us some things about yourself, about what you've been up to lately that's been fun, enjoyable, where you felt like on the job and... Uh, well, actually, I just had a, I had a good long weekend. I, um, oh, right. That's just this weekend just, just gone? Just this weekend just gone, yeah. I okay. uh, spent the weekend at Strawn on the west coast. Oh, yeah. And I uh, went up the Gordon River and... Uh, oh, my goodness. Did the, yeah, I went up on... Um, uh, federal hotels have... Um, well, they own a lot of the strong village down there and they've got a cruise uh, that goes up okay. up the Gordon River. Um, so I went I up on that. up there many, many, probably before you were born. I remember the, the, the colour of the water was like the colour of black tea. Yeah, no, it's still the same. Still the same? Still Very the same. Very peaty. Yeah, it's all the tannins out of the, yeah. the uh, button grass and that. Oh, the the wash down into the river, yeah. I remember being totally surprised at the colour it was. Yeah, no, I... Um, did it in comfort in the soil this time, okay. so I sat on the upper deck and uh, yeah, right. yeah, and then went on the Wilderness Railway yesterday okay. from Queenstown, the old apt system that they used to pull it. <laughs> uh, a bloke by the name of Roman Apt designed a railway system to uh, haul the train up over the steep hill that's between Queenstown and Straw. Oh, yeah. So that's a, um, a tourist attraction that they've... What's the, what's the system? Is it a... It's a rack and pinion system. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's a, a third rail that runs up yeah, the middle yeah, of the two lines with the cogs, the cogs in it. Mm. They've got the pinion on the oh, yeah, middle on of the, the train, train. Mm. To, uh, so it doesn't run backwards until yeah, we get yeah. up over the top. Mm. So that was an enjoyable weekend. Yeah, nice you want to make sure that those, the, the cogs are sure. in good uh, working order. You wouldn't mm. want to... Mm. That's pretty steep up there. Uh, one in 16 on the way up, so for... Uh, you go for every 16 metres and you go one metre up. Uh, for one a train, in, that's... that's pretty, yeah, it's pretty significant. Right. And one in 20 on the way down. So you come down a different way than the way you go up, presumably? Well, you go up the hill, over the top, and down to... Oh, I see, down the other side. To Strong. So we went, I went from Queens down to Strong. Okay. Yeah, when I was down there all those years ago, the copper mine was still... Mm. Uh, yeah. Operating, so every, all the hills that they had no vegetation. It's still going. And um, all the hills were kind of a bluey greeny colour, if I remember rightly. The yeah, yeah, there's was. not a lot of the way trees on them at the moment, but oh, yeah. they're, they're starting to regenerate a bit. They've changed their processes. Yeah. Uh, the the mine's still open. Yeah, yeah, about another 50 years, I think, they'll <coughs> run it for. Uh -huh. Amazing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a good place to go and have a look at. So what, what, was, what was it about the weekend? I, was, I mean, it sounds great, but I mean, I, can you tell me about that? I think what I would enjoy. But what, what was good about it for you? Um, well, actually, the reason I went up there is I'm taking a group of camp quality kids back there in September. So oh, I went okay. to uh, do a bit of research. You find out what it was like before. Yeah. yeah so uh, and I know the general manager of um, Federal Hotels there. Oh, yeah. So I rang him up and asked him about. Um, what we could do for the kids and those sorts of things. He said, well, come up and have a look. So I did. And uh, we went up the Gordon River, as I said, and it was mm. beautiful. It was just on the upper deck and uh, mm. got pretty spoiled, so it was nice and relaxing. And although I've been up there before and walked around Sarah and all that sort of stuff, it's always been um, in my own boat sort of thing, oh, and yeah. my own power and those sorts of things. That so was a, oh, yeah. a little bit different experience. Oh, yeah. So I enjoyed that, and it was nice and relaxing. When you're on a boat, I mean, I presume you had a motor or you weren't having to row, were you? No, no, no. <laughs> no, a bit beyond that. <laughs> so, and what are you doing with these kids? What's um, I've been involved in camp quality for about 18 years now. And um, about the last five, maybe six years, uh, one of the roles I took on was to organise a senior camp for the older, the older group of kids in camp quality in Tasmania and take them on a holiday, in their September holidays, September school holidays, so I've had them um, to Queensland, to the theme parks up there, uh, Parish of Blue, Snow Skiing, Sydney, Commonwealth Games, northwest coast of Tasmania, 
Where did these kids come from? All like? over Tasmania. They've all had cancer. Oh, okay. So, yeah, Camp Quality is an organisation that um, provides some kids that have had a life-threatening form of cancer with an experience that they may not or otherwise have got a chance to have. It also provides the families with some time off. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, So we take the kids um, without any, any family members along. We look after them and organise some activities and some fun. Yeah, you say they have some experiences, but they would otherwise they wouldn't have had them. Yeah, we've got quite a few from um, low socio-economic backgrounds that come along, and you know some of the stuff that we do with them, there's just no way in the world that they'd ever get hard, ever get a chance yeah, to yeah. to do it. And like some of the other kids um, from from a, a better environment. One I know very well lives in Sandy Bay, but uh, I bet you he's done a whole range of things that he never ever would have done. Mm. So, yeah, it gives them something, something to brighten their lives up a little bit. Yeah, brighten, and also, as you said, to extend it. Mm. Like there's some things that <clears throat> that would would not have been possible. Oh yeah, uh, it's it's proven that. Um, the camps are good therapy for the kids, oh, especially those undergoing treatment. They look forward to them. Oh, I bet. Um, doctors will even um, customise their treatment around the camps oh, is that so? to oh, enable them to go. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I think there's, there's evidence that how we are and our mood affects our immune system. You know, our response to cancer affects all kinds of things. How our body is, how we, you know, people get. We know get tension headaches by kind of holding the more things that we can do. How we are in our emotions that can have a big influence on our body. I think we kind of know that from our everyday experience. So it makes sense that by taking them to a place like that where they can <coughs> expand, to have some experiences they'd otherwise not have. I can imagine that it might even help the, the cancer. Yeah, I think more so than the experience is um, the relationships they have with the other kids. Oh, yeah. They, uh, yeah, they're there with people that have been through exactly the same thing that they're going through, so they bounce oh, yeah. off each other a fair bit. Oh, okay. um, they're quite open with their, with their sickness and their treatment with each other. They talk mm. about it and, and they get good support from each other through it. Mm. So it's, uh, they're, they're a wonderful, wonderful group of kids. Yeah, that kind of internal support, yeah. that mutual support. Yeah. So it's it's nearly like a second family for a lot yeah, of them. Yeah, and I know yeah. it is for me. You, know, yeah. you, you sure. walk down the street and see somebody from Camp Island mm. and you always stop and say hello. Mm. Have you seen the Godfather films? Uh, no. They you know, sound like like you're a, like a Godfather doing good work, not they're doing bad stuff. But it's the same. That connection is really making that contribution is really something, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, there's there's a, a really good group of people that volunteer their time here in Tasmania mm. to, mm. to look after the kids and organise things for them. So we're, we're pretty lucky here in Tassie. Uh, it's very inspiring, Brett. Right? Yeah, we get plenty of good support from the community as well. Okay. So yeah, it's good. So what uh, you hear, as you know, we're, we're having a hypnosis today, and uh, you've done some hypnosis with Gabriel before, I think. Yeah. Okay. And so you already know the kind of experience of it and how it can provide an opportunity to have a different relationship with yourself, within yourself. Um, so what could we talk about here that would be useful if we could do something helpful here? Well, I suppose the reason I came and saw Gabrielle in the first place is because I suffer from sleep apnea. Oh, yeah. And, um... Already, if you say that, it lets me know that you're an excellent hypnotic subject. Mm. Because to have sleep apnea, you have to be able to get so deeply absorbed to sleep so deeply that you forget to breathe. Now, that is deep sleeping. Yeah, well, oh, I don't know, that's my problem, but my problem is I can't stay asleep, I think. So, um, yeah, I did, did the sleep studies and all that, and I think they figured out that I wake up 40 time, 48 times an hour on average for a minute each time. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but you wake up because you've gone so deeply. Uh, because my airway shut off. Yeah, but you've got to get deep for, to do that. Yeah, so. So, so that, what, what would you like to have happen here then? Well, currently the treatment that I'm on for is what they call a CPAP machine which is constant positive air pressure, so it blows oh. air into your airways through okay. a, um, well there's a few different 
piece of apparatus I use is a full face mask and this smaller mask and then there's some things that sort of fit around your nose and seal off around your nose and I've tried them all um, and I've got the one that sort of seals off around my nose now which I found the best of them all but I still struggle with it. It's not so much the best, it's the least worst, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's so if we, could, if we could do something that was even less worse, what would that be? I'd get rid of it altogether. Well, if, if, if we did that, what would be different? What would you... If you got rid of it altogether and you just go to sleep and you you wake up in the morning and you've been breathing all night, and would you have stayed asleep or would you have... Um, what? Well, um... If I stay asleep all night, well, that's that's the aim of it. Right. Um, whether I but you want to wake up get, in the morning. You if know, I get you yeah. to get the big sleep, you know. Well, you know, I got close to that not too long ago too. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, what I the hope is that um, I can get some better. Gabriel and I talked last time about um, making me more tolerant of the sleep pad machine because oh, yeah. I really struggle with it at the moment. Oh, yeah. And then the possibility of um, getting to a point where um, my airways are trained enough that they don't fully close off during or when I go to sleep. So where, does the, where does the closure happen, do you know? What, what level is it? Is it in my throat? Or? Uh, I don't know for sure, no. no they but haven't told me. Do you have a feeling? Or? No, I've got no idea. But they say that um, it's it's usually the soft palate. Okay. Sometimes it can be the tongue. Oh, yeah. So it's usually either one of those two. Okay. Um, and they fall against the back of the throat and close oh, off the airways. Yeah. There's, uh, there are some devices that you can put on your tongue to hold your tongue forward, Charming. so that you don't do it. Um, but and there's what, also paper clips or something like that. Oh, it's, a, it's a funny sort of plastic thing that's God, used. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. It's, no, no. Well, I haven't, I haven't tried it yet. To no, be honest. Oh well, there you are. There's something. There's some other things, other forms of torture yeah. that you could have a go at. But there's also a procedure called pillar implants where they can put some oh, yeah. Teflon, Teflon rods in yourself oh, yeah. and try and give that a bit more structure to stop mm -hmm. it from falling back on your throat. But uh, I spoke to the doctor about it, and he basically. I reckon no, no, no good, CPAP's the only way to go. So no. I do you, to him, do you drink much? Are you a red wine drinker? Or ah, I like a red, definitely. Yeah. I remember someone I um, stayed with up in Albury. He was an anaesthetist and he, he was a member of the local red wine club mm -hmm. then. And uh, he had a problem with snoring. And he had uh, surgery and had stuff done there so that his soft palate would be scarred and it's going to shrink so that it wouldn't flop around and snore. And uh, he was great for a while. But, but the problem was that his throat was so sore he couldn't drink the red wine. Yeah. As soon as his palate settled down, he started drinking the red wine, he started snoring again. What but happens with that operation is they cut, they cut away a piece of the soft palate. Oh, yeah. So the, it's supposed to open up the gap to stop oh, yeah. snoring. Oh, yeah. What happens, you get the scarring over the top of it oh, yeah. and builds it back to its original size so you don't win anything. I think he was, he was thinking it was the red wine, but that's not, that's not an issue for no. you. It's not that you, you drink a lot and that, no, I, not like a general anesthetic. No, no, I'd be lucky to, I wouldn't have a glass of red a day. No. But, yes, but I do enjoy it. I, I so if you do imagine there's something happening there that the soft palate is too floppy or too soft or... Loose, I think it's a state of relaxation that just lets it collapse back. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I've put on a bit of weight in the last seven years, mm. and I think that's contributed to it a bit as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, it's just that. Uh, well, the idea of it is when it, when you wake back up, it stops the muscles from relaxing so much, and you, yeah, you tend to make them back up again, and it so. lifts it off the back of your throat. I think so. I think that's the thing. I think you're just too good at relaxing. Could be. There's a, you know, there's a, a certain amount of relaxation which is great, but if you take it too far, then you're in trouble. Maybe a bit like drinking red wine. You know, like a glass or two of red wine is great, but if you have too many bottles of it, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing. Hmm. How have you gone into hypnosis with Gabriel? Have you just relaxed your body or has he ever uh, lifted your hand and shown you how to go into hypnosis that way? No. No, the, uh, the time we did, 
It was just, um, she was just talking to me. Oh, okay. And, uh, Would it be alright if I were to lift your hand then? Yeah. It's just another way of helping to, you know, hypnosis, mm -hmm. we say, is not like an anaesthetic. It's um, an experience where there's some kind of focus, get focused on something. Mm -hmm. Perhaps when Gabriel was using hypnosis, you may have focused on her voice or some part of your experience. <clears throat> and then as that happens, if you let yourself get focused on that and absorbed in it, and you're starting to demonstrate already how good you are at focusing. It's very easy for you to focus. Mm -hmm. And very easy for you to become deeply absorbed in something. And I can see how very naturally you can just get into this experience. It's almost like you just settle into it. It might be like settling into that upper deck and that... Uh, Yacht? Uh, launch? Big catarine, yeah, launches. Yeah, that, that boat. Mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of just settle into that. And I'd like you to notice, Nancy, that there is a natural tendency, of course, for that hand to just drift down because that's gravity. But if you were to look at your hand and just notice the way it can rest there. There can be a way that somehow in the balance of the muscles, the relationship between the muscles which would let your hand down and the ones that lift it up, that you can get a kind of a balance there. And I'd like you to notice that and just allow yourself to, as it started to settle into that place where you can let it rest there without you needing to hold it or does it still feel like you're holding it there? Yeah, it probably still feels as though I'm holding it a little. A little. So if you notice that you're not holding it there as much as you were, and then if you can let yourself somehow allow that process of holding it even less, and yet it can stay there. And you don't really know how to do that, but you're learning something. Would be okay if I lifted your other hand? Mm -hmm. That's it. I don't know which hand can allow you to learn it easiest. But if you can just notice something there, it may be that as you're looking at your right hand, that your left hand is learning something. Or it may be that you can notice out of the corner of your awareness that something is happening to your left hand. Now, it might be interesting for you, and I can't really know exactly how, to discover that one of your hands is going to start to move up towards your face. Now, you don't have any difficulty in lifting your hand to your face. You've done that many times. But there's something interestingly different here for you to discover. And that is that without your intention, without you choosing, without you just moving your hand, if you notice, those hands can start to feel interestingly different. And even though they can settle into that place of being in that balanced position, not all the way down, not all the way up, but one of them can start to feel, you can start to notice, maybe you'll feel it, maybe you'll see it, a tendency to lift. And the rest of your body is showing that uh, characteristic relaxation so that your breathing is deeper. That's it. Slower. There's a stillness in all the rest of your body, but there is some movement in your hands, and I don't know whether you can see that or feel it, as your eyes are getting ready to close all the way down. And your hands, that's it. That's it. And your left hand is showing that movement up towards your face. 
that's it. And your right hand is having its own learning. And this is a learning for you, Brett, not as an intellect, not as an emotion. This is a learning for you in your body. In the same way there can be a different emotion in your own boat or in the Federal Hotel's boat. But the experience is a bodily experience. Just as you can see the colour in the Gordon River, in the river, but the tannin comes from upstream, from that grass. Now, as I continue to talk, you can allow my words to be just there, just like the sound of a, a motor inboard or the sound of the water or the sound of the wind or birds or other people talking in the background. My words are so unimportant and there is no need for you to go deeply into this experience to discover that as you can and you have that capacity to go very deeply. Learn a way of going only as deeply as can be useful to you. A person can go scuba diving they can have a mask on their face. They can have uh, cylinders on their back. Oh, I've never been scuba diving. I'm only talking from what I've heard. But what I've heard is that even though with scuba you can go very deeply, you don't have to always go as deeply as you can. In fact, I've heard people have a very nice time by staying not very far under the surface at all and they can stay there for a long time and while this is happening and your body is learning so much more than you can know and that left hand is moving I don't know whether you can feel the, the to and fro movements of it and your right hand also and as that uh, movement of your left hand, that's it, is gradually getting organized, it can be like it can click into some kind of mechanism. That even though it's a steep gradient up towards your face, it can move upwards. It's just a matter of getting that organized, <clears throat> not too quickly, because if you can notice it in your own time, slowly, then you can really appreciate. That's it. That's right. Now it's starting to move more uh, obviously. It's starting to move up to your face in a way that I can see. It's gradually getting those movements aligned, going upstream, lifting, that's it, that's right, and there is that kind of jerky movement, almost like a ratchet, like cogs in a well-oiled machine, up it goes, that's it. While that left hand is moving up to your face, take a 
taking a very nice, slow, ambly way, but inevitably up to your face. Your right hand is learning something very, very important. And it's not like I have an answer for this. And it's not like you have an answer for this. But if you can allow your left hand and your right hand in the relationship that they can make between each other, and the relationship that your left hand can have with any other part of your body, and your right hand can have with any other part of your body, not only one hand with the other, but a whole community of connections and relationships. <clears throat> I know when my 35-year-old <clears throat> son <clears throat> was first at school, he learned to write with his right hand. And he fell over and broke his elbow. Had his arm in a sling for weeks. I don't know how long it had taken him to learn to write with his right hand. But within a week, he'd learned to write with his left hand because that writing was a learning in him that had been expressed in one way. He just needed to find another way of expressing it easily, which he did. And, as that hand continues to do what it's doing, moving, that's it. And as you breathe, that's it. That's right. Taking your time. It's letting that happen. that you don't need to know just like on that camp <clears throat> all those camps you don't need to know all of the conversations that are happening you can't but you can know that a lot is happening you can't know about it, but know that it's happening and feel good about it not just that it sounds nice not even that it feels good but it actually does good That's it. because there is a mechanism <clears throat> when a, a baby lie on his back. It doesn't know that it's its left hand that it's reaching out to try and touch with its left hand. It doesn't know. What is me? And what is you? After a while, baby learns to touch the hand on the cot. Then they touch the hand with the other hand. And when one hand touches the other hand, there's that double experience. Ah, oh, that's me. Later on, child knows, oh, that's me, and that's not me. And they make all those connections within themselves, more than they can know. Because as they get older, and they start to learn to feed themselves, they find out where their mouth is. And they know to put the food in their mouth, not in their ear or their eye. 
is that coordination. Now, they don't say to themselves, oh, I'm going to be careful and make sure I get the food where it needs to go. It goes in the wrong place sometimes. until they learn how to balance those muscles so that they can feed themselves just the right amount. Not too much, not too little. And that's a learning. That's right. It's a learning. And nobody can know how we learn those things. Now, you can learn something in one way as a child, and you can adapt that learning. I learned to ride a bicycle. And as a teenager, I learned roller skates. Twenty years later, I put on some ice skates and learning to roller skate, I could translate that into ice skating. So we can learn something in one place, even though it's different, we can translate it. You've been up the Gordon River in your boat. You can go out in the Federal Hotel's boat. You can go up there with those kids. It's a different experience. And you take one experience and you translate it. It's a learning, an adapting a learning. And you've learnt a lot. More than you know, when a child's learning to whistle, they hold their mouth in a certain way. They think that they're doing it with their lips. But their whole soft palate, their whole throat, all the muscles are involved in that. They don't realise it. Every time you swallow food, you chew food, and you don't know that as you're doing that, all the muscles are doing exactly what they need to do. It's a learning. And your left hand is learning a lot right now. That's it. And so is your right hand. But I doubt if you could explain in a way that, that anyone, anyone else could understand how you're going to use that learning but you're using it in a way that you're learning now. In the matter of breathing. You breathe in, you breathe out. You breathe in, you breathe out. And there is the right amount of attention. And you can put the right amount of attention and the right amount of relaxation. As you breathe in, you not only lift, that's it, that's it, all the way down. Except before your hands get all the way down, you can notice a tendency for them to move. And there could be something about the way those hands tend to drift down that you can notice and not struggle against it but for example as your right hand might move down a little maybe you could imagine that something is lifting it up and you could think it's going to go all the way down onto your thigh but actually it can get, it has got that bit closer, but before it touches your thigh, it can start to feel lighter and lift. That's it. 
Do you notice that? That's it. It looks like that's it. Looks like it's going down, but then that's it. It moves. That's right. And your left hand too. And you're breathing. You don't need to think consciously, intentionally. Oh, that's enough. Now I'll breathe out. But there's a way of learning to breathe. That's it. That you learned long ago, before you were even born. How to breathe. And you learned that. Research has shown that babies breathe before they're born. They breathe that fluid that they uh, bathed in. And it's only when they're born that they then start to breathe air. And they make that adaption. And people who learn scuba make an adaption to breathing air in one way and breathing air in another way. And that right hand, I want you to notice that as it moves closer to your leg, something can happen there. You don't need to know what it is, but something can happen. That's it. Something. What will it be? Will you notice that? And then discover it's starting to lift again? Will you intentionally lift it? Will you purposely be curious? Just what's happening there? What is going to happen so that this right hand will not touch your leg yet? You might notice that the more relaxed you become, the more it tends to drift down. And there's something about how you can learn to relax only so much. When you're sitting on the top deck of that Federal Hotel's boat, you don't relax so much that you fall off the chair. You relax just enough. And what's going to happen to that hand? What's going to happen to that hand? What are you going to notice? What changes are you going to... You can't know... Maybe you're, st ah, you're starting to get a hint of it now. That's right. There it is. Now what are you just starting to notice about that, Brett? Can you say what's happening with your right hand? It just feels like it's gradually going down. It feels like it's gradually going down, yes. It is gradually going down, and it feels like it's gradually going down because it is. But what are you noticing about how, the f how it's not going to go all the way down yet? What are you noticing about that? How do you know it's not going to go all the way down to your leg yet? Because it seems like it's gradually going all the way down, but it's not. What's going to stop it? Know. You don't know, but you're smiling because you're wondering what it might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is it okay to not know but to be curious? Yeah. Yeah, because you're going to find out something. Simple, easy. It'll be obvious once you find it out. You might not necessarily be able to put it into words. But something is going to stop that hand. What will it be? One of the things that could stop it is that I could lift it. That'd be one thing. 
Voilà ce que je t'en veux. I'd like you to be really curious and have a degree of uncertainty and maybe even think it's going to touch me. Maybe even not see how. It's going to stay off your leg because it feels like it's going to touch your leg. It feels like it's going to move down. It's interesting to have that doubt. And do you still feel like it's going to move all the way down? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you might be right. You notice the different way that that hand's moving? It's not the usual kind of way that your hand moves, is it? No. It has a kind of an automatic kind of movement. Normally, <clears throat> your hand would move down way quicker than that. Do you think it's going to touch your leg? Eventually. Eventually it will, yes. That's for sure. Uh -huh. Now, what do you notice about your hand touching your leg? What do you notice about yourself? My hand sort of feels numb. Your hand feels numb, yes. Can you feel that it's touching your leg? Yeah. Yeah. And what's different if I were to lift this hand now from how I lifted it before? What do you notice about your hand that's different now? It feels heavier. It's heavier. Mm. And there's something about that heaviness. Now. Mm. Mm. It's nice to know that even though you had that doubt, probably the first time in your life that you even had a doubt about whether your right hand could touch your leg. Do you notice how even though the tips of your fingers are in touch with your knee, even though I'm pushing on your wrist, Almost like that hand doesn't want to go all the way down. Can mm -hmm. you feel that? Can you feel how lightly your hand is touching your leg? Even though your hand felt heavy, it's actually touching your leg quite lightly. How do you make sense of that? children tell me that they can be asleep 
and jaw will stir and they'll hear it. Uh, other people say <clears throat> they set the alarm in the morning, six o'clock. A minute to six they'll wake up. They'll wake up before the alarm, turn the alarm off. It's almost as if somehow within the self there is a, no matter how deeply we're sleeping, some part of us stays on the job, stays alert. Might be something like when you're going on a camp. You let those kids do what they need to do, but you're keeping a weather eye on them. Somehow, in your awareness, you've got some part of you is alert. Do you know what I mean? You can be having a good time, you can be relaxing, you're not listening to every word, you're not watching everything they do. But if something isn't quite right, you get a sense of it. Yeah, know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that can happen on a camp and it can also happen within your body. Like with this hand. It can be touching lightly. How are you feeling at the moment, Brett? You feel fine? Mm. Are you relaxed? Uh, I'm so so. So so, yes. It's nice to know that you have the capacity to relax very deeply and also the capacity to be relaxed so-so. Because this is an experience for you to learn. You don't need any help to learn to relax. It is my opinion, and it's only an opinion, that you're actually too good at relaxing. So it is my opinion, and it's only mine, can't know whether it's really true, that by relaxing a little less at night, sleeping a little less deeply, and what I'm saying doesn't need to make sense in a logical way. You do not have to believe what I'm saying or agree with me. No one has a right to ask that. But you can hear the words that I'm speaking. You can make your own sense of the ideas that I'm offering you. And you can make your own translation of that. Learning happens that way. Now, I wonder if it would be interesting for you to know that you have the capacity to let your eyes open now, but also discover that you can leave them closed. You have that choice, you could open them, leave them closed, and to know that it would be very easy for you to let them open, but actually somehow just let them rest comfortably closed for a time. And then as that experience continues, to allow that learning just as when you run, walk up hills, <clears throat> your breathing naturally becomes deeper. Naturally goes faster. And when you rest, relax, your breathing naturally becomes slower and not as deep. It's a natural response. And it's a response that we learn, it's built in, we learn it, and that learning can be adapted. 
once you can learn to snow ski, you can learn to water ski. It's an adaption. You learn to snow ski, you can learn to snowboard. It's an adaption. They're different. But when you're a child, you learn to walk. You learn to balance. You learn to move your left foot and your right foot, your right arm and your left arm. And when you were learning to walk, you didn't know that one day you'd be doing very different ways of balancing on skis. And I can talk about different things. That's it. And you're discovering something at the moment. What do you notice about your left hand? It's going down. It is going down. And you notice that you didn't need to decide. It went down by itself. That's it. And can you let it rest there for a moment? And as it is there, there may be some things that Gabriel has said some things that other people have said, some things that you know. Because we all know a lot more than we know. We all have a lot of abilities that are there waiting to be discovered. That as that's happening, You can put things together. Because within you, there's a whole community of support. The left leg supports your head indirectly. Your right hand supports your left shoulder indirectly. They're all connected. Even parts of the body that you don't know even exist as a connection. I remember saying just recently again, Karate Kid. You ever see that film? Yeah where, you know, wax on, wax off. Painting the fence up and down. Sand the floor this way, that way. And learn those actions in a disconnected way. And he thought he was waxing, he thought he was sanding, he thought he was painting, but he was learning. The coordination of the body. When he was waxing on and off, one hand, the other hand, he didn't need to notice there was something happening with his feet. But when you put the wax on with your right hand, you have to do something with your left foot without realizing it, to maintain the balance. That all the muscles of the spine, all the muscles of the forehead, of the face, the shoulders, the muscles of the abdominal wall, All of the internal arrangements are subtly changed. And 
when he learned that wax on, wax off, sand the floor, paint the fence, he didn't know that he was learning karate. He learned it without knowing. And there's a whole lot of things that you've learned in one way. And that's why in this experience, it is an experience that allows for different balance in you. There's a slight nod of your head. That can allow a rearrangement. Of some of the internal structures, you don't even need to know what they are. because they happen automatically. They happen outside of your awareness. They can even happen in your sleep. And there's no way for me to know, because I can't know you, I can't predict the future, whether just before you, you had taken that dip that let your soft palate relax and close off your airway, that you'll somehow, instead of waking up, just lighten ever so slightly. Whether the ups and downs, the depths and coming up to the surface, will be just as steep 116, 1 in 20, whatever, just as steep. But before you get to the bottom, you can start to go up. Before you get to the top, you can start to go down. Or whether it'll be somehow as if the, the depths are not so deep and the, the top's not so, not so high. So it'll be a kind of a flattening out whether there will be something like skiing where you learn to do those moves parallel skiing not just snowplay now something can arrive an idea, an experience and that's it they can just drop into place. But it doesn't need to drop so deeply that it disappears. And there was something that happened just then that can really let you know. Are you feeling relaxed at the moment? Yeah. So so? Yep. Hmm. And did you feel a kind of a a jerking letting go a moment ago yeah yeah how come you only let it it was only momentary you didn't fall all the way if i can use fall as a as a way of speaking how did you stop that going too far silly question well it's silly to expect an answer because you can't answer that can you I don't think so. I don't think so either. So you don't really need to know how you can limit the drop like that to know that you just did that. And so you can in other ways, in other places, in other experiences, not only in your sleeping, but with your eating, with your weight, many different areas of your life. And always remember 
the joy that you have in contributing and the support that you get from the community there's just as much joy, just as much support attending to that internal community that you are and there's a lot of support there and a lot of benefit there a lot of good learning there the way that so many things that could happen like on those camps like within you that beforehand without them there's no way then that experience happens that, that camp happens those camps happen on the snow in the theme parks and the fun parks and the Gordon River not yet And you can't know how all those new connections are going to be made, those communications, those relationships. The same way that happens on those camps. Exactly the same way. And it can take time. It doesn't have to happen instantly. Sometimes you go on camp and it takes a little while for people to kind of thaw, to get used to each other, to make those connections. And it's your job to, it's your pleasure, your privilege, your joy to witness the way that can happen. Yeah. I don't know if there are any particular expectations that you had. Out of this conversation. And I always like to think that whenever there's an opportunity like this for learning, things can get worse. Things can get better, or they can stay the same. And in general, that's the case. But there are some circumstances that my experience teaches me. I can pick people who are going to do well. And I think it's so nice we've had the opportunity to have this conversation I really like to work with people who are going to get a good result but it does not have to be a direct response consequence to this place it may be you see something on television you read something you talk to someone and something makes sense and so those changes can happen because of this. Or as a flow on from this. Or independent from this. Maybe even in spite of this. But there is no way for you to know yet just how. changes can happen in a way that you can want and that you can achieve and that's why in a situation like this you don't need to have anything special in your mind but you can find your own way of 
are somehow beginning to be more usually here. I don't know when you'll be ready to let your eyes open. Even though you could have opened them before, you didn't. I wonder when you'll be ready to let them open now. That's it. It's so nice to know that they can open and you don't need to rush it. It's nice to put that off. Just letting all of that settle. Because any new learning, new connections, can take a moment to get set. It's like glow, it takes a while to get set for it, really. Just that quick. Takes a while for a group of people to settle. It's nice to know that you can wake up and open your eyes and you can be comfortably having your eyes closed, being relaxed just the right amount, not too much. doctor I work with in America <clears throat> told me about four graduate students. He was working in Phoenix down south. And these four graduate students came from Illinois. And two of them thought they would pass their majors and fail their minors. And two of them thought that they would fail their majors and pass their minors. And two that thought they would pass their majors and fail their minors. Failed their majors, passed their minors. And two that thought they were going to fail their majors and pass their minors, passed everything. He said, in other words, they listened to what they needed to listen to. And they made their own adjustments. And he said those students were so grateful to what they'd learned that they went to a lot of trouble to find a telephone to give him as a gift. He was colorblind and liked to surround himself with the color purple. <coughs> and they found a purple telephone for him. They actually had one cast, especially. And he told me that. And when he told me that, I must admit that I wondered whether he really expected me to believe that seems a little bit unlikely. But the next year I was visiting again and one of the people in the group uh, was down from Illinois and we were chatting during the break and he said oh, I don't know whether you noticed that purple telephone. 
and I started to listen. He said there were four of us that came down. And uh, two, of the, two of us thought we were going to pass their majors and file their minors. I was one of the two that thought we were going to, to fail their majors and pass their minors. You know, the strange thing was that the people, the two that thought they were going to pass their majors, fail their minors. Some strange reason. They failed their majors, passed their minors. And my friend and I thought that we were going to fail our majors and pass it. We passed everything. Unexpected outcome. But he said, I'm particularly glad that I was able to make those connections and learn to make good use of them. And he said it was difficult to find the right connections to get that purple telephone. But we did it. And my guess is that that telephone is still there after all those years. Because once you made the connections, there it was. And how soon do you think you'll be ready to let your eyes open? It's nice for you to feel that reluctance and experience it. Do you think you're ever going to get them open? Think it's a permanent state? What do you reckon, Brett? I didn't ask you, is it okay to ask what sort of work you do? Um, basically, I'm an HR consultant. Uh, okay. That's the easiest way to describe it. Okay, so you, you, you know how to connect people and help to connect with their own work and their own responses and their own well, ability. I do at times. Yeah. Have you ever had a, a situation where someone says, oh, I can't stand this? And somehow you talk with them and they find a way of. Uh, lots of times. A friend of mine in Melbourne was working in prison. I make a joke about him saying they let him out in January because he's been there for probably at least long enough. But a couple of years ago he was thinking of leaving. He said, I, I can't stand this any longer. And he went to the person who was in charge of the psychology at uh, the prison. And she said, oh, don't you love the smell, you know, the smell of the prison, the, the disinfectant. She said, oh, it's so great. And he said, uh, well, I suppose that he actually, her enthusiasm was so great that he actually managed to stay there another couple of years. So um, I think helping to make those connections is, is uh, so satisfying, isn't it? Do it in the work, yes, do it in the yeah. other activity of yours. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you might want to ask me before we stop the conversation, before we come to the end of it? No, nothing that I can think of immediately. Okay. Um, could you say anything that's different for you now than when we started? A lot of stillness in your body. Anything different? No, nothing that I can notice, nothing that stands out. Excellent. And I think it would be so beautiful if those changes continued in a way that you didn't need to notice. When they happen gradually and under the surface like that, that's the best way. You see those kids growing. You know, if you see them and then you see them again, you see them growing. They don't see that they're taller. Because it happens so gradually. It's the best way. The ones that get into trouble are the ones that where bits of them grow too quickly. It's called cancer. <laughs> so it's good to see slow growth. Would it be okay if we were to leave it at that today? Yeah. And is it okay if we make a video of this for future teaching? Yeah. You know, there may be some people who could look at a conversation like this and learn something about uh, how.
how to how someone can make those connections like you have without even knowing exactly what they are. That would that be all right? Okay. Thank you so much for being willing to be here and to uh, let me be part of your learning and uh, useful outcome. Thank you. Mm.